night. Workers rise up in Russia. Trump and the writer's strike. And... I'm sorry, guys. Oh, they're not happy. The Defense Department is launching its own investigation into ousted Trump advisor Michael Flynn, a move the White House called appropriate. Army documents declassified today show the Pentagon told Flynn in 2014 not to accept foreign government payments, warning it would be illegal if he did. Flynn accepted money from Russia and Turkey in 2015 and then lied about it. You have no evidence, zilch, that he obtained permission from the Secretary of the Army and the Secretary of State to accept any foreign government payments as required by law. United Airlines reached a settlement with the passenger who was filmed being dragged off of one of its flights earlier this month. The lawyer for David Dow said the deal was amicable, but didn't disclose how much United paid. Social media videos of police violently removing the 69-year-old doctor sparked public outrage against the company. The Pentagon announced today that two American service members were killed fighting the Islamic State in Afghanistan's Nangarhar province on Wednesday. It's the same area where an American soldier died earlier this month and where the U.S. dropped the so-called Moab bomb on April 14th. A group of nationalists stormed Macedonia's parliament building, breaking through a police barricade and attacking lawmakers. They're opposed to an ethnic Albanian who was elected parliament speaker, which has never happened before in the country. An Albanian militant insurgency nearly pushed Macedonia into civil war in 2001. Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny, who recently got out of jail for organizing national anti-corruption protests, says he was attacked in Moscow with a chemical antiseptic, which burned his right eye. The same thing happened to Navalny last month, and no one was arrested for it. Navalny was the driving force behind huge anti-corruption protests that erupted in Russia last month, where authorities arrested more than a thousand people. That brutal crackdown betrayed the Kremlin's uneasiness with the unrest, but appears to have neutralized the movement, at least for now. But another movement is just getting started, and it's already proving to be much more difficult to suppress. A protest by truck drivers took hold in Moscow today, and it was just one small part of a series of labor strikes that have begun to engulf the country after three years of economic paralysis. And this working-class uprising forms a direct threat to Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev, who more than half of Russians now want thrown out of office. It's the third day that Sergei Ovchinnikov's truck has been parked idle on the side of this highway outside St. Petersburg. Вот мой автомобиль, контейнеровоз, кормилец. Именно на нем я пытаюсь сводить концы с концами. Sergei is taking part in a nationwide strike by Russia's long-distance truckers, part of a sporadic protest that started over 18 months ago and now reaches as far as cities in Siberia and Dagestan. Their protest headquarters is an empty semi-trailer. They're organizing against a government-imposed road tax. But the movement has become about more than just that. It's about economic fairness and government leaders who they say are taking more from them all the time. То, что нам сейчас Медведев ввел повышение тарифа Платона всего лишь на 25% вместо обещанных 100%, Это не считается какой-то победой или достижением. Нет, это... Is your complaint more about the taxation, or is it about corruption, or is it about the politics? У нас жалобы потому, что значит наши политики воруют слишком много денег, а народ при этом очень сильно нищает. You've talked about Medvedev being responsible. Do you also blame Putin for that too? Конечно. Они, они все как пауки в банке, там, как змеиный клубок. Они вот так вот все перепутали и пытаются меняться друг с другом, чередовая вот этот вот тандем Медведев и Путин. Лично мое мнение, что Путин это тоже номинальная фигура. Не было бы Путина, был бы кто-то другой. Complaints about Russia's popular leaders, especially President Vladimir Putin, who has a national approval rating in the low 80s, aren't a common thing to hear. And not everyone in the industry is on board. 
But those who are are part of a quiet upsurge in economic unrest happening in localities across the country, undercovered by official news channels and overshadowed by the more coordinated and photogenic urban protest movement. Miners near the southern city of Rostov have been protesting late wage payments for nearly two years, and farmers in the Red Basket region of Krasnodar have been demonstrating against crop seizures by powerful agricultural companies. If this fragmented constellation of movements can get its act together, it might actually pose a threat to Putin. В дальнейшем, когда проблемы не решаются, становятся застарелыми, происходит объединение. Я думаю, что здесь произойдет то же самое. Nikolai Miranov is a labor rights campaigner and monitor. He says that last year, the number of individual labor disputes doubled, a consequence of rising discontent over Western sanctions and Russia's ongoing economic crisis. Still, he acknowledges the moment of effective coordination might be a way off. Should the Kremlin be worried? Большинство населения страны э, просто уже с большим трудом выживает на те доходы, которые у них есть. Им сложно воспитывать детей, сложно дать им какое-то будущее. Э, в этой ситуации недовольство растет очень быстро. И весь вопрос просто, куда оно локализуется. Меня, в частности, задержали в Петербурге, в Иркутске задержали людей, в Красноярске, практически во всех регионах. Andrei Bozhutin is the head of the truckers' rights organization that started this most recent sit-in, one day, coincidentally, after Navalny's protest. It's also faced harassment by the police, but the groups remain disconnected. Truck drivers, they're not the same as the people who are going into the streets in Moscow or St. Petersburg. They seem like very different groups of people. It's of course. And I'll tell you that when the Balot was the Balot, when Alexei Navalny выводил интеллигенцию. В свое время этот протест назвали протестом норковых шуб. Это была интеллигенция. Мы другие люди, мы рабочие люди. Когда выходят люди протестовать в центрах городов пешком на митинге, это не оказывает такого воздействия, как оказывает то, что делаем мы с нашей техникой. A week later, we rejoined Andre outside St. Petersburg as he tried to lead an unauthorized convoy through the city. Police and anti-riot units watched them closely. They got about 100 meters before being shut down. Andre was one of eight people detained. He was released seven hours later. House Republicans have begun hearings on what they're calling the Financial Choice Act. It's an apt name for a deregulation bill that'll dismantle Dodd-Frank, the system of safeguards Obama put in place to prevent meltdowns like the 2008 financial crisis. Most of those rules apply to bankers, but there's at least one proposed change that'll have a direct effect on every consumer. For the past five years, Americans have been able to file public complaints about banks, credit card companies, and all sorts of other organizations in the financial sector. A government agency called the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which was created as part of Dodd-Frank to hold companies accountable, runs the database, and publishes most of the entries online. It's kind of like a Yelp for banks. It's very popular. Almost 750,000 complaints have been published so far. It's very negative. A lot of the complaints look like this and the banks really don't like it. 
The thing is, neither do Republicans. Originally, they wanted all the complaints to be fact-checked before they were made public. It's unclear why they abandoned that, but to be fair, it does sound like a logistical nightmare. Now, they don't want any of the complaints online. Their argument is basically that companies can suffer irreparable damage when inaccurate things are said about them on this government-run site. Michael Barr was one of the people who testified against the replacement bill. He helped write Dodd Frank and points out the complaints on the site already helped expose one of the biggest banking scandals in recent history. They use the data not as uh, evidence uh, necessarily of a violation of law, but as an indication that the company may be having significant problems with its consumers. And it may point to a broader set of problems uh, that the company is uh, having, uh, some of which may uh, indeed be illegal, as in the Wells Fargo case. No company should be looking to try and hide uh, information about consumer complaints. Uh, that information is going to come out, as it should. Barr thinks companies are right to care about their reputations. But he says the answer isn't hiding the complaints. It's behaving in a way that doesn't create the complaints in the first place. Following a spectacular fall from grace, flamboyant megatroll Milo Yiannopoulos just announced he'll return to UC Berkeley this fall to hold a week of free speech rallies. In February, Yiannopoulos was invited to speak at the university's campus, but never did. After a seething mob of opponents hurling rocks and Molotov cocktails forced the university to cancel the event. The same greeting awaited an appearance by Ann Coulter planned for today, leading Berkeley to cancel her speech as well. But that's the exact reaction right-wing provocateurs thrive on. And now, Milo's seizing the moment to return to relevance. Or try. Michael Moynihan visited him outside Miami. I think we should do Berkeley, but I think we should do it in May, and I think that we should um, we should stage a big march. And you could do press conferences once every couple of years, and I used mine up this year. At that press conference, Yiannopoulos would apologize for a recently surfaced recording in which he defended relationships between adults and younger boys. Some of those relationships between younger boys and older men, the sort of coming-of-age relationships, the relationships in which those older men ha help those young boys to discover who they are. And with that, it all came crashing down. CPAC, the annual gathering of the conservative elite, withdrew an invitation to speak. A quarter million dollar book contract was canceled. He resigned from Breitbart. And then Milo went quiet. Fuck you! You're not safe here! But the character of Milo needs controversy to survive and isn't easily dispatched. It was forged by a troubled childhood in England. Are your parents still alive? Unfortunately. <laughs> I can't really ask for a better answer than that. No, I just find them really boring. And, and, I, and it's this sort of thing where you're supposed to like respect and love your parents. And I'm like, okay, fine, I will. Come on, you're um, a conservative. Exactly, exactly. So I have all this pressure on me to, to be nice to my mom and dad. And actually, they're just really boring. And my mom was a complete cunt, so yeah. who cares? My mom's new husband who beat me up. He okay. beat you up? Well, a little bit. I mean, I had, to, bit. I had to make excuses for black eyes from time to time. I like set fire to stuff. You know, I was a little shit. I probably deserved you set it. Fire to things. Microwave the cat once. Oh. <laughs> you literally just explained everything about yourself in one very short. <laughs> no, but the cat. I felt like the cat was getting more attention. I'm sorry. You, you felt like the cat was getting more attention, so you put it in the microwave. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> But I was young and I was damaged. Uh, you microwaved the fucking We had cat. no, but we had a no. It didn't die. I only did it for a few <laughs> seconds. Fortified by a half dozen flutes of champagne, Yiannopoulos put the sunglasses on, and the bomb throwing character emerged. Do you Whatever. regret apologizing? No, um, I think it was worthwhile doing because. You know, I've given a lot of interviews in the past where I've said, I don't say anything I don't believe, and I don't. I but you've said similar things a number of times, right? I think the mistake I made, and the reason I apologized, is I, you know, I think there were, I think I got carried away into saying something I didn't quite, I, I would not want to defend. And I think it is a smaller man. I think it is a petty person. I think it is somebody without integrity who refuses to apologize. Milo, you've done one Even in your entire career. Even when they've misspoken. But one time you And done I it? believe that I have misspoken once. And that one time that I have misspoken, I apologize for. Okay, well that's a certain level of confidence that I have to give a grudging well, I mean, respect you're to. You're well, no, you're welcome to provide other examples if oh, you can think it's of... It's too exhausting. We, no, no, we, no, 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 that's not good enough. That, no, 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 I'm, right. I'm gonna push you. You wanna do it? That's not good enough. Let's do it. Yes. Let's do it. You're, you're challenging the wrong guy. I'm as troubled by violence towards innocent children as the next sociopath, 
But those kids in Syria who were killed in the gas attack are only growing up to be oppressors of women and murderers of homosexuals anyway. Isn't that funny? Don't you find that funny? I defend it. It's funny. I'm mystified by the punchline in this one. We're talking about kids who have been gassed in a sarin gas attack. Well, now you, you stand by it. Yes, of course I do. No, it's, I, now it's, defend it on, this, on, on its merits because you can make a joke about anything, but that actually well, that was has... a joke. That was yes, a joke. but it has a political content too. Defend it. Yeah, of course it has a political content. I defend it. I mean, like, you know, I, as a gay man, I find Islam to be an existential threat to my existence. And if I want to make a joke along those lines, being like, you know, I don't know why we're all so worried about Syrian You're kids. They're only, gonna, they're only going to grow up to be people who want to kill us and oppress our mothers anyway. Totally fine. Totally so, stand by it. Absolutely fine. You know, it's sort of a be, genocidal point, though. Kill the children because they might grow up to be something terrible. Oh, but this is this is what the left does. This is, you know, take, taking the, the contents of throwaway remarks and jokes. And like, clown knows on, big... clown knows off. Sometimes I don't know if you're being funny or if yes. you're being serious because well, that seems like a serious... You should always assume I'm being funny. Okay. You should always assume I'm being funny. But so what is like, a... What I'm, is a I'm just like, it's a joke. What do I take away from that comment? You take away from that comment. Well, I don't know. What do, you, what do you do? You have to take something away from it? I mean, it's... it's Why make it, then? Because it's funny. Everyone, else, everyone in the room laughed when I said it. Um, you know. All of these things that happened to you. Mm -hmm. They're just grist for the mills. They've sweetheart. made you stronger. Uh, well, you know, what does not kill me makes me more fabulous. Um, look, unless you literally leave me in a coffin, unless you, I am dead on a battlefield, like with, with spears in my back, with my head pounded into the dust, I'm going nowhere. And nothing and no one can take me out, least of all the fucking media. The Writers Guild of America, the union representing more than 12,000 film and TV writers, is on the brink of a strike over wages. Unless the writers are able to reach an agreement with the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, which represents the major studios, the strike could start as early as May 2nd. Dexter Thomas explains what that could mean for your favorite shows. If a show has a script or writers, it could get affected by a strike. Dramas like The Walking Dead could get delayed this season, and late night talk shows like The Daily Show or Stephen Colbert could just go on hiatus. And even things like the MTV Movie and TV Awards could take a dive too. If you really love these shows, you might be a little worried. But there's one person who probably isn't, the president. Saturday Night Live would have to cancel the last three shows of this season. And Donald Trump's made it pretty clear that he doesn't like SNL. There's also a brand new show on Comedy Central called The President Show. And it seems like it's pretty much dedicated to making fun of Donald Trump. If a writer's strike happens, that one's out too. And actually, this wouldn't be the first time that a writer's strike worked out in Donald Trump's favor. Back in 2007, NBC had just canceled his show, The Apprentice, because the ratings weren't good. And then the writer's strike happened. And their two most popular shows, The Office and Scrubs, had to end their seasons early. So they decided to bring The Apprentice back. They were able to do this because not all reality shows use union writers. The new version was called Celebrity Apprentice. It was a huge hit and went on for seven more seasons. It put him into millions of homes, made him way more popular, and you know the rest. So if a writer's strike does happen, Donald Trump might catch a break and not have to watch shows that he doesn't like. And he won't even have to sign an executive order to do it. All right, so real quick, guys, I want to do a safety talk. Um, so we are going underground into a mine. Avoid touching the walls if you can help it, and watch your head, certainly, where you're going. Our job is to find every dead bat and every band, so we have to make sure that we're paying attention to that, and that's our prime goal going in there. Onward. Tim Carter and Martin Von Hoff are researchers in Michigan investigating white nose syndrome, a disease killing millions of bats in the U.S. So you haven't been to this specific mine, you haven't checked out these bats since the fall? No. That's correct. We are here to assess the results of a long-term experiment to test a treatment against white nose syndrome. What is white nose syndrome? It's a fungal disease that infects the bats. It's a pretty devastating disease that started, uh, came over uh, from Europe in 2006 accidentally, introduced into New York, and it has been spreading from that epicenter in New York across the country. So far, white nose syndrome has been identified in 31 states, mostly in the Northeast. But U.S. Fish and Wildlife tells us it's spreading west. In March, the fungus that causes it was identified in Texas. And last week, the disease was confirmed in Oklahoma. 
As it moves through these populations of bats, we're seeing massive declines, uh, mortality rates of, you know, certainly over 80%, in some cases as high as 90, 95% of the population is dying as a result of this disease. White nose syndrome isn't just devastating to bats, it's a huge problem for the economy. Bats eat a lot of insects, including moths and beetles. That means that they're crucial for pest control, saving American farmers an estimated $3.7 billion in crop damages every year. Researchers across the country are trying to figure out what can be done to stop the disease's spread. What is the absolute worst case scenario once we go into that mine? Worst case scenario is that we go into that mine and find every bat dead on the ground. Martin and Tim conducted an experiment in this mine last December. They cataloged 165 bats and treated half of them with Kaidazan, a compound they hope will help fight the fungus. They sealed up the mine last fall. Today, they'll find out if any of the bats survived the winter. Dead bats are sorted into Ziploc bags and live ones into paper bags. Bunch of dead bats around here. Both live and dead bats will then be taken to a field lab for analysis. Okay, so we've got a live bat up in here. A live bat, believe it or not, this is how much they move when they're hibernating. The fungus irritates certain bat species, like little brown bats, causing them to wake up and fly around during the winter when they should be hibernating. Because of this, they end up spending a lot more energy than they should at a time when there's no food available to sustain them. So this poor guy is alive, he's not doing very well. Eventually, they die from starvation. What are we looking at? So this is what they're oh, supposed wow. to, that's what they're supposed to look like. So there are a bunch of different bats around here. Yeah, we've got three. We've got a pair right here and then a single one right up in there. They're cute little guys. Yeah, they are kind of cute, I have to admit. <laughs> and then we've got, oh, I'm sorry guys. Oh, oh they're no. not happy. He's yeah. snarling at you. Yeah, well, he's not happy at all. So far, you've found a few dead ones, lots of live ones. What does that tell you? I mean, it's kind of what we expect. We're hoping to have some live bats and some dead bats. Of course, we will not know who's who until after we get back and check the numbers on their bands. So I don't know if I'm looking at a treated bat or if I'm looking at a control bat. So it's really too early to tell if we have any success, other than we're happy that we've got some live bats and some dead bats. All right, folks, we only have roughly 57 live bats. We will PD swab and micro swab every bat. Some infected bats develop a white fuzzy growth on their noses, but the most common sign of the disease are lesions on their wings and tails. Female, fan number is M2402. Punch. And he will be tissue punch number eight. The only way to truly tell if a bat has the disease, however, is to send samples for analysis. Right now, Tim and Martin are trying to save as many bats as possible. But they know that even if an effective control method is found, bat populations will take a long time to recover. That's because, unlike other small mammals, bats reproduce slowly. Females only have one pup a year. Every year, that white nose impacts bat populations, it will take approximately 100 years or more to offset those losses. So right now, we are at about 10 years of white nose losses. If we could wave a magic wand today and just get rid of white nose, it would be more than 1,000 years before bats could get back to where they were just 10 years ago. Tim and Martin will have to wait for the final results of this winter's treatment trials. In the meantime, they've released some of the surviving bats back into the cave. That's Vice News Tonight for Thursday, April 27th. Tune in tomorrow night at 7.30 Eastern for a special episode on the first 100 days of Donald Trump. Well, I think I may be under surveillance. The government can't be involved. That's like horseshit. You're going to bring Jaws back to America, and I'm going to hold you to it. It's a good day. What they're doing is not right trying to force me to do something that I can't do legally.